So we are now recording. Today is December 5th, 2023, and this is a call hosted by the Taos Institute. And we have the monthly calls called Dialogue with the Author, where we feature um, a very innovative book. And today we are really excited about the book that we're gonna be talking about for the next hour. Um, I would like to turn it over to Ken Gergen to do some introductions, and then Mark Freeman will be taking over the rest of the call. Yeah, thanks, John. It's really an enormous pleasure to be introducing this dialogue today. Um, Mark sent me the copy of the book, The Use and Abuses of Stories, um, which he and Anna Maratoya edited. It's a fantastic collection, I've got to say. I mean, I, I don't read too many edited books these days. Um, but as I looked through this one, began reading the chapters, I realized it's right on the mark. It's bringing narrative studies into contemporary issues, facing those issues in a very direct, meaningful, um, sophisticated way. Um, issues which we have been wrestling with here in the Taos Institute for a number of years as well. So I'm really, really uh, enormously happy to have you and the group of you who have been writing these chapters here with us today. <clears throat> Mark, um, I should say just for a moment, as an um, old dear friend, we've gone through uh, many battles together and had good times together, and uh, it's just a pleasure seeing you again here today. Uh, I take it you'll introduce Hanna in just a few minutes from the University of Turku. Mark, a uh, distinguished professor of ethics and, and social thought, uh, Holy Cross, ethics and society, as well as the editor of an entire series of over 20 books on explorations in narrative psychology that Oxford University Press puts out. So it's fantastic having you here. Now, I do want to say one small thing before we get started. Uh, just because a lot of the people here would be coming out of a constructionist background, may not be familiar with the narrative hermeneutics or hermeneutics. And it's just to say that the hermeneutics and social construction are very close companions in terms of most of their concerns. In some way, it's a matter of emphasis, whereas social construction will tend to place the process of meaning making in the social sphere with less emphasis on the personal. Uh, usually the hermeneutics will place more emphasis on the social, inter the individual interpretation, but recognizing the significance of the social. But the problems they're concerned with today in terms of issues of multiplicity, of truth, of governance, and the future are, are critical. So with that, Mark, let me turn it over to you. Uh, Great. Thanks so much, Ken, for that introduction. Um, you know, it's it's great to be in dialogue with you. Ken and I have been in dialogue for many years um, about lots of issues, and and we've also had the opportunity to do some really fun, challenging, collaborative work together um, for the Society for Qualitative Inquiry in Psychology. So it really is a, a special pleasure um, to be here. At Taos. Um, I'm going to just briefly introduce the people uh, from the book, the contributors who are here today. Um, my co-author, editor, conspirator, Hannah Maratoya, is professor of comparative literature and director of SELMA, the Center for the Study of Storytelling, Experientiality, and Memory at the University of Turku in Finland. Um, and it really has been a great pleasure to work with Hannah on this project. Molly Andrews is Honorary Professor of Political Psychology at the Social Research Institute, University College London, as well as the co-director of the Association of Narrative Research and Practice. Clive Baldwin is Canada Research Chair in Narrative Studies and Professor of Social Work at St. Thomas University in Fredericton, New Brunswick. Brian Schiff is the Edmund Nissim Professor of Psychology and Director of the George and Irina Schaefer Center for the Study of Genocide 
Human Rights and Conflict Prevention at the American University of Paris. His co-presenter, Kaylee Altimore, is a graduate of the American University of Paris with a degree in anthropology and globalization, as well as a minor in linguistics. Georgia Warnke is a philosopher and professor emerita of political science at the University of California, Riverside. Danielle Spencer is academic director of the Columbia University Narrative Medicine Program. And then finally, Brad Lewis is a practicing psychiatrist as well as associate professor at NYU's Gallatin School of Individualized Study. And he also has affiliations with the Department of Social and Cultural Analysis, the Disability Studies Program, and the Medical Humanities Division. Um, so, you know, we are really lucky, <laughs> um, Hannah and I, to have gathered contributions from these really remarkable people. Um, and it's great to have them here today. Uh, I don't recall all the details of Hannah's and my discussion about editing a volume together, um, but I checked my email today and it was way back in 2014. And the volume was going to be about narrative and hermeneutics or the theory of interpretation, uh, bringing together philosophy, psychology um, and literature. It wasn't too long after that that we were beginning to see reference to the narrative all over the political landscape. And it was also around the same time that Donald Trump burst on the political scene and that we were beginning to see how narratives could be manipulated for nefarious and sometimes positively destructive purposes. So what had begun as a more purely academic work um, morphed into something substantially different different and much more in touch, uh, as Ken suggested, with what was going on in the wider world, um, not only in the context of politics, but psychiatry, medicine, history, law, and more. I'm not going to say more about, you know, the, the generic uh, volume. Um, I'd rather have people speak about their specific contributions. My own chapter um, called The Inevitability and Danger of Narrative focuses on issues tied to the so-called post-truth era, especially as manifested in contemporary US politics. The chapter begins somewhat defensively by trying to respond to a claim made by some critics that some of us interpretation and narrative types including social constructionists, are partly responsible for inspiring certain aspects of the post-truth era. Um, I don't happen to buy the claim, but I do understand why it's been leveled. For if we in fact believe that interpretation and narrative are inevitable when it comes to making sense of the human realm, and if we also believe that there is no wholly neutral place from which to arbitrate truth claims, then how, one might ask, can we legitimately say that some stories are flat out fictions or lies? So here's the dilemma, or at least an element of it. We can't possibly indict these fictions and falsehoods for what they patently are, unless we have some working conception of what truth in the narrative domain is all about. Without this, all we can have is a war of competing narratives of exactly the sort we often see in the political realm. So that's the first and most basic problem. The second related problem is that patently false though some narratives may be, they may nevertheless be held onto tightly and immovably. And there may be no way to quote, convert those who are so ensconced in their narratives, false though they may, de, may be, that they reject other ones out of hand. So this is one of narratives prime dangers. They can be utterly impervious to change 
to being modified. Hence the narrative impasses and standstills that have come to characterize so much of the political landscape. In the US especially, but well beyond its borders too, as is tragically clear in the current Israeli-Palestinian context. At an extreme, it seems that people are not only telling incommensurable stories, but inhabiting incommensurable worlds. The third and last problem I want to identify is probably the most dangerous of all. And it's about what I've come to call narrative self-enclosure. That is, and here I'm quoting from an earlier piece, quote, the kind of dynamic where a narrative loses its foothold in the real and becomes hermetically self-enclosed, such that one comes to live in a story world of one's own making, end quote. Those words were from a talk I gave on Donald Trump um, at the American University of Paris back in January of 2017, right after he was elected. And it was around that time that I also offered a thesis of sorts, which reads as follows. When the relationship of narrative to reality is severed, we run the risk of falling prey to tyranny the totalizing story being but a short step from totalitarianism. I'm sorry to say it, but we're just about there. And it's not clear how to stop it. Scary times. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Hannah, who will share some words about her own chapter. Hannah. Thank you so much. Um, so... And I'm that great to be here, so thank you for hosting the event. Uh, the starting point of my chapter is um, that the discussion about the benefits and dangers of narratives gets easily polarized, both among narrative scholars and in the public. And I think it's important to acknowledge that narratives in themselves are neither good nor bad for us. So it all depends on the context of their use, and we need more more nuanced evaluative tools to discuss the uses and abuses of stories, both in our everyday lives and in politics. And narrative hermeneutics, I understand that as, a, as an approach that suggests that narratives are not only objects of uh, objects of in interpretation, as uh, literary narratologists uh, tend to uh, suggest. Uh, instead, narratives are also modes of interpretation in their own right. So they are cultural practices of sense making, and narratives are not <clears throat> narratives not only provide interpretative um, accounts of experiences and events, um, but they can also function as models of sense making in the sense that they can shape how we experience things in the first place. I start my chapter with an analysis of the post truth uh, debate, and I argue for a more nuanced uh, approach to what is often seen as narrative versus truth dichotomy. Narrative is often lumped together with so-called uh, postmodernism or, or relativism. Um, um, and uh, some commentators argue that we should move from subjectivism to objectivism and just simply respect objective facts. But what I suggest is that we should instead move beyond this uh, objectivism, subjectivism dichotomy it's a false and problematic dichotomy, and we should be rather aware of how we inevitably interpret and narrativize the world. This doesn't mean that we shouldn't be committed to truth, but it means that truth is intersubjectively negotiated, and what we consider as facts uh, also tend to be part of narrative webs of meaning. So I argue for the importance of hermeneutic awareness, with which I mean awareness of the interpretative resources that we use, to make sense of the world. Such awareness is crucial to narrative agency. And with this concept, I mean our ability to navigate our narrative environments, to make choices over what kinds of narrative uh, interpretative resources we use in making sense of our lives and of the world. And in the latter part of my chapter, I partly draw on my own experience with uh, cancer. I analyze normative narratives linked to illness as an example of how narratives can um, have, how narratives have this kind of existential uh, aspect that they can 
um, they can diminish what I call uh, existential breathing space or lead to this kind of existential diminishment. For example, by disallowing certain kinds of um, emotional responses to news about serious illness, I explore how the narrative of war and battle, which is widely used in the context of illnesses, both uh, cancer and, for example, the pandemic, uh, this uh, this narrative model problematically uh, positions patients as winners and losers and creates pressure in patients to have the right kind of mindset as if, if, as if it's up to them if they survive or not. Uh, and by ascribing agency to patients, health workers and to the public collectively, battle narratives uh, used in the context of the pandemic, for example, can lead to a false illusion of control and can prevent us from seeing the fundamental randomness of life. Much more helpful would be a narrative imagination that cultivates a sense of how we are all dependent on each other at various stages of our lives. So in relation to the issues of post-truth and illness narratives, I analyze the existential, ethical and political aspects of narratives um, and suggest that what we need is awareness of the narrative interpretive resources we use rather than an attempt to move beyond narrative. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. Molly. Um, yeah, well, hello, everyone. And um, Ken, thank you so much for inviting us. The only thing that I would say is um, I really, really, really wish that we were in person in Taos. That would be um, quite something indeed. <laughs> So next time, please. Um, so yeah, just to say um, briefly, the, the chapter that I contributed to this book is um, nothing that I ever could have imagined writing. Let me put it that way. I think Mark said, what was it back in 2014 or something that, or 16, I can't remember. Anyway, that you first had the idea for this book and I put in an abstract, um, you know, for a chapter that I would like to contribute. I think the general idea of use and abuse of stories is a really good one. When it came time to deliver that chapter, my own life was in a surprising place, um, which was that I had just been made redundant from a job that I held for 25 years. And um, and I simply said to Mark and Hannah, who are not only good scholars, but good friends, I'm really sorry, but actually I, I can't produce that chapter and I can't really write anything right now. Um, and um, they suggested to me that I actually use that experience as a starting point, which is in fact what I did. And I um, not only um, took support from my scholarly friendship with them, but indeed two other people as well in the form of Isaac Dinesen and Hannah Arendt, no less. Now, it will be um, familiar to many of you, the, the quote, which was supposedly said by Isaac Dinesen, um, which is here, all sorrows can be born if you put them into a story or tell a story about them. The story reveals the meaning of what otherwise would remain an unbearable sequence of sheer happenings. Well, in fact, what was really interesting to me was that Isaac Dinesen never really did say that quote, okay? In fact, for those of you who would like to know what she did say, she says, I'm a storyteller. One of my friends said about me that I think all sorrows can be born if you put them into a story. And that, and that is not entirely untrue. I think it's really interesting. But Hannah Rent, anyway, for, <laughs> for whatever reasons of her own, and that's what I was interested in, took a lot of... Um, she she drew on that quote no less than three times in her some of her major writings. So she clearly actually got something from that. And here for me then was the challenge. How could I um, try to make a story out of the experiences that I was having, which to me were very hard to make sense of? The specific application was in my decision whether or not to... Um, to appeal against what I saw as being a very unjust decision against me. But of course, the people who would be um, assessing that decision were not in a position to overthrow it, okay? So in fact, what I did is I, I amassed no I, 61 documents um, to try to tell, quote, the truth of the story. And I in what I try to do in this chapter is to actually show why, even though I could not have possibly overturned that decision, it was in fact important to try to do so. And so I'm just going to end with a 
one of the quotes from Arendt that I use here. Um, she says, the chances of factual truth surviving the onslaught of power are very slim indeed. But even while truth is always defeated in a head-on clash with the powers that be, it possesses a strength of its own. Truth is the ground on which we stand and the sky that stretches above us. And I would like to um, just end there and, sit, and to say thank you very much to Mark and Hannah for giving me the invitation um, to write in that way. And we're really glad that you did because it's... Uh... It's a moving and excellent chapter. So I'm glad you agreed. Clive. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, my, my piece, I, for a while I've been interested in how people make sense of themselves in relationship to the world, how they create a viable, sustainable identity when almost nothing out there validates that that identity. How do they, you know, you know, how do they story that, themselves, and and on what stories can they draw in order to to maintain that sense of self? I was first, I was invited by Mark and Hannah to to write on um, some research I was doing on transableism, the, the desire or the need to acquire a physical impairment, which is one of those sorts of stories that, um, you know, in, in our society, you know, disability and physical impairment is viewed, you know, as tragic, as sad, as lost, you know, and it's certainly not something that you should wish upon yourself or bring about for yourself. You know, so I was in, I'd interviewed people who had two working legs, but only wanted one of them and found various ways of removing or having removed a leg. So I thought about this and um, my, my chapter, I, I thought about the issues that this raises for, the stories and our storied identities, but the issues seem to be even more heightened and more prominent in another piece of work I was doing, which was on uh, with individuals who identify as other than human, um, other kin, those who identify as uh, fictional, fantastic, mythological type creatures, Therians, Therian throats, who identify as um, sort of this worldly type of animals, dogs, cats, bears, wolves, and the like, um, and, and, and vampires. Um, and I, I've conducted interviews with a range of these, because you know, whereas most of us have a set of cultural resources, a cultural story, you know, a, a resource of, of stories on which to draw to help shape our identity, for example, I'm Catholic. There are, you know, millions of stories about being Catholic, and but it's okay. You know, there are f far fewer stories about what it what it's like or the viability of being, you know, a, a wolf or a dragon or an elf or whatever. So how do people do this? So we interview them, and you know, you know the two examples I use in. In, in, in the chapter are awakening stories, which are the stories of the first realizations that, you know, I am not, uh, I, I am other than human, um, and stories about that, that sort of help explain that because self evidently they have human bodies that, you know, it does, you know, from the outside it looks and sounds really weird. Um, and so, Stories about um, having a, the soul of a dragon, the soul of an elf, whatever, as walk-ins or whatever. Um, and so looking at, at how people story their lives and the blend of cultural resources they use in order to shape their, their identities, that they're not just sort of, you know, 
first order mimetic you know, representations of life. They draw on uh, on uh, on fiction, on on prose, on poetry, uh, um, in order to create this. Um, and so, you know, the conclusion is really that you know, perhaps we need to thinking about ident narrative identity. We need to loosen up. The, the insistence that a first order mimesis uh, and, and look towards what we might learn from uh, unnatural narratives, narratives that don't represent this world um, and you know what you know how we can play with narratives in order to make sense of ourselves, our position in the world and our position in relationship to others. Mike Tuppence. Great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Clive. Another fascinating chapter. So um, we do have four other presentations. We'll, you know, we'll all try to keep them certainly within uh, the three minutes each to make sure we have some time for discussion. Um, and with that, let's turn it over to Georgia. Yeah, so um, my contribution to the volume was, is interested in the idea that uh, says that stories and lives um, should, should be told only by those who share the same identity with those people. Um, so the example I start with is uh, the, the criticism of Hannah, by Hannah Black of um, Dana Schultz's painting in the Whitney Biennial of um, Emmett Till in his um, casket with his with his mutilated body, um, and I um, argue that that prohibition that says that you can only tell the stories of people who are like you who have the same identity as you um, misunderstands both identity and experience. So um, uh, the idea is identities are come in different kinds, right? So Hannah Black is a British, a black British artist living in Berlin. Um, so what experiences is she supposed to share with um, with Emmett Till that that uh, that Dana Schultz does not? Um, second, um, experience. So <clears throat> the idea is that you can only understand someone who has the same, similar experiences to you. But if we look at people like, um, Hegel and Gadamer, it becomes quite clear that experience is negative. We have an experience when something is not as we supposed. Um, and so, um, we can see parts of the stories that perhaps those more familiar with them can't. Um, so limiting stories to those with similar experiences um, limits precisely this kind of insight. Um, of course, um, insights can also be completely skewed, um, but it seems to me that the only um, solution we have to that is more insights and more dialogue. Um, so uh, we have to be able to challenge and to defend the insights of one another in discourse. And that's my chapter. Thanks. Thanks, Georgia. Brian and Kaylee. Hi. Um, thanks for the invitation uh, to, to be here today. And yes, we're going to keep it very brief. Um, so, uh, my chapter, our chapter, uh, that I wrote with, uh, Kaylee Altimore, who is going to speak just after me and Genevieve, uh, Bouget, who are both American University of Paris students. Um, we attempt to think through some of the problems of making sense of others in particular perpetrators of mass violence, such as genocide. We ask, how can we understand others so radically different, different from ourselves? The actions of perpetrators feel a great distance from the comfort of our lives, and it's difficult to fathom the depth of their cruelty and callousness. 
Also, they might not be willing or even able to claim responsibility for their actions. What should the stance of the interpreter be in relationship to these questions? In this light, Paul recurs distinction between the hermeneutics of suspicion or demystification and a hermeneutics of faithfulness or restoration is a productive point of reflection. Although perpetrators would seem to call for hermeneutics of suspicion, provocatively, we argue for the necessity of restoration. Of course, there is warrant for both stances, but there's much to learn from a restorative stance, which understands perpetrators from their perspective, placing their words within a point of view and a set of meanings, a horizon, as Gadamer has described. Our analysis is grounded in a reading of Gita Sereni's Into That Darkness, an examination of conscience, and her interpretation of Franz Stengel, Commandant of Treblinka, and his role in the murder of the disabled and Jews during the Shoah. As Brian was saying, rather than believing that perpetrators are too different from us, our work questions the ways in which interpretation may be short-sighted or skewed when we choose not to recognize our own situatedness in space and time. What insight do we forgo by allowing our own moral worlds to cloud our understanding of otherness? Through the work of Schwader and colleagues, we acknowledge the ways in which certain systems of morality, what they call the ethics of autonomy, community, and divinity, are different depending on the context at hand. Genocides and other atrocities are complex phenomena. Group crimes that require the construction of cultural models, alternate moral universes through which one comes to understand what is good or right, what is just, and what needs to be done. Horizons of meaning that have to be restored in order to understand what perpetrators believed and the meanings that scaffolded their crimes. Perpetrators like Shengel cannot be understood without us seeing them as moral actors and understanding their words as meaningful expressions of their subjective motivations. We argue that the interpretation of the perpetrators of atrocity crimes requires us to recontextualize their actions and motivations within their own moral universes and that this can be a powerful asset in the toolkit of the hermeneutics of restoration. Thank you. Thank you both. Danielle. Yes, hello everyone. Um, I'm particularly pleased that we're having this discussion in this context because of the, um, the work of the Institute uh, in integrating scholarship professional practices and social practices, because my field of narrative medicine has a very interesting uh, position between scholarship and professional practice, in this case, in the context of healthcare. The chapter is about narrative medicine and narrative hermeneutics. And I begin with the foundational understanding of narrative medicine, which is really a methodic claim, which is that better readers make better doctors. And so utilizing um, literature and other forms of art to abet close reading skills, uh, to increase close reading skills with the goal that uh, clinicians will be better able to interpret and absorb stories of illness and perhaps to offer uh, some balm for the existential diminishment that Hannah mentioned earlier. Um, and in the paper, I, I do draw upon some other scholars framing, um, referencing Godmer, who we've heard about several times already in the course of this hour. Um, to make a distinction between the more methodic and hermeneutical framework or contemporary hermeneutical framework, which is to say that um, narrative medicine may have used this methodic claim to gain entrance into the fortress of biomedicine. And here I offer an unforgivably uh, clunky mixed metaphor of a Trojan horse book, which is that it does this in order to penetrate the um, closely guarded enclave of, for example, the medical school curriculum. Uh, and then once inside from its belly, the book bursts forth, which is to say that once you start reading, writing and interpreting, then um, all the aspects of contemporary hermeneutics become quite apparent in an experiential way. Um, and that this is destabilizing of the um, epistemic exclusivity of biomedicine, which tends to privilege um, biomedical claims over 
the lived experience of illness, um, thereby contributing to the diminishment of the humanity of clinicians and practitioners and uh, clinicians and patients alike. Um, uh, I will I will pause there. Thank you. Thanks, Danielle. Last but not least, Brad. Hi. Good afternoon, everybody. Nice to be here. Ken, nice to see you again after many years. We used to go to conferences yes. together. Um, I'm very much uh, um, sort of good to follow Danielle because I've been thinking in the language of narrative psychiatry, which is a sibling of narrative medicine. And uh, my paper called Psychiatric Truth and Narrative Hermeneutic stages a, depending on how dramatic you want to be, a, a conflict or a uh, conversation between, I, I made puppets today, between two different worldviews. Um, one is a sort of dominant textbook of psychiatry in a current edition um, that uses a pretty strong biochemical approach. Um, that's interesting, not only because of the what's happening in psychiatry, but how through alignments with various other large players, it bleeds out into culture and becomes the culture through which we make sense of ourselves. And the other is a story by Edward Standicat, uh, which is a Haitian American family, extended family, and one of the members um, has a lot of sadness and withdrawal and isolation after having uh, her first child. And uh, what's interesting is um, the conflict of interpretation, but it it's um, it's not what you might expect. It's not like interpretation A versus interpretation B so much as it is a sort of single-minded interpretation versus a multiplicity of interpretations. Is that sadness um, because of chemical imbalances? Is it hormonal imbalances? Uh, is it grief? Is it cognitive distortions? Is it sexism? Um, is it the impact of racism and colonialism? Is it a separation from spiritual religious communities? Uh, the story holds all of these uh, at play. Um, and the other difference, of course, is it's open to ambiguity, uncertainty, possibility, multiplicity, um, whereas here you have much more uh, attempt to get um, sort of declarative um, necessity. Um, and and then I put them together with narrative psychiatry, which tries to set up the conditions of a dialogue where um, which truth to live, which truth to invite into one's um, experience, helps set up communities, helps set up ways of life, helps set up um, sort of understandings of the past and the possibilities of the futures opens up the, the opportunity to combine or mix different possible ways of making sense, um, depending on um, situations. Um, and, 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 and I thought that, I thought this, this was a book I wrote, Narrative Psychiatry. I thought this was the best way to do it. <laughs> although, although I, I, I must say that I felt very much in line with the Edward Zanikat story, and because art in general and literary fiction in particular um, often can hold this negative capability of not too quickly sort of uh, grasping onto certainties uh, and can, can live with comfort in the multiplicities of meaning. And that, that was my chapter. Thanks, Brad. Um, what you just said reminded me of a, a well-known TED talk on the danger of a single story that some of you are probably familiar with. Um, and your work is a good antidote to that. Ken, um, we don't have quite as much time for discussion as we all might have hoped, but at the same time, I hope people have benefited from hearing uh, the different contributors. So it's a remarkable group. I thank them along with Hannah again, but go to it, Ken. Yeah, thank you all so much. Uh, I, I'll just raise one question, and then perhaps we can go on from there and invite people to uh, raise questions in the chat if they'd like. If, if I take this collection together uh, and consider the 
what I think is the question that we all have while constructionist and hermeneuticist tries multiplicity, tries the multiple voices, are uh, open to pluralism. I mean, this has been part of where we came into the world with these ideas. It's been championing pluralism and realizing that we can't deal with it very well, particularly if some of the plurals I actually are saying things which are abominable, oppressive, uh, leading, uh, which seem to be utter lies or, or, or simply unacceptable. What do we do with that? Now, in some ways, you've all dealt with that in a certain degree. Uh, Molly said, well, look, it's really important sometimes to hold on to your, your story. And Clive, well, we have people who... who have stories which seem, you know, where they want to be wolves, and we've got to respect that somehow. And I, here I begin to think of the gender issues and those who want to claim that they're not the gender that they seem to be and how important that is. And you, Mark, who talked about the way in which we hold on to some of these narratives, even though uh, we, we just can't give them up, we can't get outside of them. And if I hear... Oh, the sort of result of that, and Brian Cayley particularly pointed out, it's in dialogue. Somehow we've got to generate more in the way of dialogue because it's the only way we can move across all these multiplicities. With that said, I want to just point out that a lot of the work in the Taos Institute is really focused on dialogue, on those practices of dialogue which have some chance. Of, of moving forward. So it, I, I invite, indeed, more dialogue between the hermeneutics and the constructionists because dialogue is kind of what we deal with. But now let me point out two issues. I could imagine, given the possibility for incommensurables, that we can have a dialogue in which we both totally understand each other's position but in which we ethically and morally find it incapable of embracing, even though we understand it, we can't live with it. So, and I just point that out, not as a criticism, but just as a sort of say, what then? Is it dialogue that we rely on here? Is it what kinds of dialogue would that be? <clears throat> and secondly, it's, it's a fear but we've kind of also, and particularly Hannah's actually been explicit about this, that whatever we consider truth that is, is going to require some kind of intersubjective agreement. But if you've got a, a technology which mass produce difference, which mass produce multiplicities, or to go back to uh, you have a you know, God's issue of you've got multiple groups of you know can believe we're werewolves or elves or whatever, and we have multiple religions, we have multiple politics, and they're continuously twenty four seven being produced. That isolation and particularism, incommensurability are just in motion all the time, and you, somehow. It, I begin to think we've got to have some more systemic conception of what dialogue would be. It's something that creates almost a continuous attempt to cross boundaries, to generate empathy. To I, and I'm not sure of that, but I just point it out as a a real question for the future: is how we how we deal with the Pluralism uh, on steroids. <laughs> okay, some thoughts. Ken, a very quick response, and then let's turn it to other people. Um, and this is something that Brian and Kaylee brought up at our last uh, gig, so to speak. Um, and it's it's a question I'm sympathetic to, and that is, are there limits to dialogue? No. Right. I mean, and you implied that in some of your comments, Ken, but, you know, there are lots of people out there in the world with whom I think it would be 
a, 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 a good thing to be able to engage in dialogue and perhaps either reach some semblance of common ground or at least reach a level of respect. But speaking for myself, there are lots of characters out there who I don't want to be in dialogue with yeah. um, because I find their views both immovable and repugnant. Now, that could be a fault of my own, admittedly, but it has come, It's it's led me to wonder um, about not only the limits of dialogue, but the limits of solicitude. Um, but I'll leave it at that. Why don't we open it up to other people, other questions? Maybe, uh, Molly, jump in. Well, can I just comment on that as well? Because when I was writing the piece that I just described, which was quite difficult for me to write, I was in conversation with my very close friend, also a scholar who I admire greatly with Nira Yuval Davis and Nira and I had this um, quite um, intense discussion where she just said it's not just about dialogue you actually have to pick very carefully who are your dialogic partners and the idea that I would in any meaningful sense be in dialogue with this university, even if I produce 61 documents, that's not, you know. And so, in fact, I think that we need to, as as is being suggested here, but I think we need to think much more carefully and much more critically, you know, between the, it's not a, a continuum where on the one side, you just stand by your story or on the two, on the, on the, on the other hand, you're just, you know, completely open to, um, you know, abandoning that story in order to come to a middle ground somehow. You know, there needs you need to think about what those components are. And I totally, I, I had to rewrite passages um, after my conversation with Nira because I thought it was really um, thoughtful and quite challenging also, ethically challenging, what she was um, asking me to think through. You want me to follow up because you mentioned what I what I said last time and just interject that a little bit. I mean, I think sure. Dolly, Molly is absolutely right that it matters who that you are in dialogue with. But I mean, I was also I, I think I pointed out the the kind of the limitations of dialogue in terms of creating at least social change in the in the in the in the close future, that it's a very uh, intense and um uh, it, it it require it, it requires a lot of time in order to to produce any kind of social change. And I also made the suggestion that at least uh, people on the right side of the political spectrum were effective in creating some kinds of social change with without dialogue. Um, and I find find that disturbing, um, but also to something that is you know may, maybe sh could be thrown in. The discussion as well too. Um, yeah, Georgia. Huh? How about yeah, let's, so it, it, let's go, Georgia, and then Hannah. And just one quick thing. Um, uh, I don't know whether Dana's question is it possible that not every character is a conversational partner. It seems to me that that's in keeping with some of what we're talking about here. So maybe she can speak to that a little later. But um, and Ken, if you want to moderate this, that's fine. But let's do Georgia and Hannah for now. Yeah. So it seems to me that in our current political situation, that the question is 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 not so much how should we limit dialogue, but how should we widen it? I mean, we're completely polarized now. People talk only to people who are exactly like them, um, who have the same experiences and the same political outlook. Um, so we're in these silos, these echo silos, ec echoing silos. Um, and so, yeah, we can get into dialogues with people that we find ethically problematic. Um, and some of those dialogues will go nowhere, but it seems to me that in the current situation, what the last thing we wanna do is cut off dialogue prematurely. And that really what is most important is to get people talking across these silos. Um, 
that's all I have to say. Anna. Yeah, so I, I agree. Actually, uh, I, I think we often think of dialogue as somehow being um, like uh, in terms of agreeing and consensus and, and talking with people like like minded people. But actually, dialogue in the kind of real sense, for example, the sense that Gardamet talks about, it's actually really hard because it involves um, kind of exposing your views and preconceptions and and uh, changing also your views. So I think uh, often a kind of real dialogue is really hard and often that, that doesn't happen, but we, it's, in, it's still really important to reflect on what are the obstacles of that kind of real dialogue. And and even when there is no uh, like progress in dialogue with somebody who is whose views are very difficult to uh, accept it's still important to engage with those uh, or try to understand in what kind of narratively mediated and narratively constructed world the other other person is living in because for example what we see in uh, for example in both the Russia Ukraine war and, and in Israel Palestine war uh, they there are these parallel universes uh, parallel realities and parallel narratively constructed worlds so um, even if like real dialogue is really hard, but it's still really important to try to uh, e even have this kind of internal dialogue, try to understand what is the kind of reality from which these different people, uh, wh where they live and why it's so hard for them to actually talk across uh, the kind of borders and, and uh, across rea their realities. So that's all. Yeah. Thank you, Anna. Uh, I knew Ken there was something to... more. Yeah, go ahead, Ken. Please, and then, then Danielle. Yeah. Well, um, it, my sense after hearing the complications of doing dialogue have my attention in terms of this, what I would call scaffolds, that is conditions of dialogue. And I think here, for example, if you've got school systems, for example, in which everyone is competing for grades based on competition of sort of all against all, it fashions the kinds of dialogues that can take place in a classroom. That it, it limits what can be said and who can be said and how things get evaluated. Government, based on the competition of two parties or parties, will invariably create yeah. polarization. That's we gain we gain votes by being against. We gain votes by not agreeing. So you've got already a, a scaffold in, in the political system for polarization, for reducing the possibilities for dialogue. So the question for me has been, what are those kinds of scaffolds and could we do something systemically that would uh, invite the forms of dialogue which we're talking about? All right, sorry, go ahead. <clears throat> Uh, if if I will will welcome Danielle in just a moment. Can say just a bit more when you use the phrase systemic conception of what dialogue might be. What what well, do you, what what do you mean? To, yeah, what I'm concerned with, Mark, is that we can generate dialogues in local situations, and there's a lot of good work on peace building that does this right. over and over again. And even even in the case of Israel Palestine, there were multiple groups which had come together in dialogic form and really, really powerful at the time and, and they explode. They yeah. can, can't sustain that. And then again, there's this issue of the continuous polarities which are being created. So it's to think in some broad terms about conditions under which would invite us uh, into our hermeneutic of of, of acceptance, I can't remember this, how you call that, um, it, in which we would be willing and able to listen to each other and, and appreciate each other, work together. For example, if you set up conditions under which collaboration is essential, suddenly you have also a different, whole different form of dialogue. So if in our organizations, or schools, or businesses, or politics, if collaboration were the goal, it would simply change the, the, the form of dialogue, mm -hmm. alter the course of how we would go about relating to each other. So it's 
It's that kind of level of trying to think broadly about the, those conditions which enable us to have the sorts of dialogues that would yield the kinds of results that we, we favor. Thanks, Ken. Rumor has it we only have a minute or two, but I do want to have uh, allow Danielle to weigh in. So, Danielle, it looks like you might have the honor <laughs> of being the last word. So, well, I'll then I'll I'll <laughs> I'll leave us on a little bit of an optimistic note, which is to say that you know in my field we're concerned with healthcare, and I actually I I do see possibilities for for dialogue and growth. I see them happening, and I see more possibilities for the future. But as far as this question of the conditions for dialogue, largely what I see as a really important condition for dialogue in this space is a shared disaffection between all the human beings who are trying to operate within the healthcare system and yet are increasingly very conscious of how we're all being interpolated into this bureaucratic system and our humanity is being destroyed. And it's a it's a it's a it's a bellwether because you know if we wanted to pick one area of human endeavor in which our humanity should be central, then perhaps healthcare should be the one. Um, and so I see uh, you know as clinicians' prestige has diminished, they are uh, realizing that they they share common goals with people who are in the role of patients, and that there are more opportunities for dialogue that are being created and pursued. Thank you. Some very important questions and comments are in the chat. Um, I don't know how much flexibility there is, if any, but I would direct people's attention to uh, to the comments that are there, which, of course, we can't uh, discuss all of them, but they're certainly worthy of our inspection. Um, um, thank John? you so much, Mark. I would like to invite everyone on this call to take these questions and comments into our online community space. We call it the Taos Institute Commons. I put the link there for the Taos Institute Commons and Alex can do a follow-up um, to everybody about a specific page related to this dialogue with the author. So you could all go to that space, continue the conversation and stay in touch with each other about the book. Uh, Don, can we place the uh, recording of this conversation on that space? Um, you mean to save the chat? Uh, no, the recording of what's going on here. We'll have sixty minutes. Uh, oh yes, we can. We can definitely do that. I can. I can have Alex put the chat in that space and also yeah. the recording in that space. The recording. So, okay. Yeah, but make sure oh. everybody, you know, grab the link that's in the chat right now. It's towards the bottom of the conversation. It's the Taos Institute comments, but Alex will be following up with everybody too, because this is a wonderful conversation to keep going. Yeah, yeah and thank you, Mark Hannah, for this wonderful book, and for those of you who contributed to it and attended today, uh, it's been a joy, and I, I think um, we're on to something. I mean, this is really important discussion today, and I really uh, hope we can press it forward. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ken, and thank you, Dawn. Um, and all of you for being here. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.